he said, look, this is about audience reach. This is about reaching people who aren't going to tune into it when it airs on network TV. And, you know, you may not catch on YouTube or some other platform. So at the end of the day, you just want viewership. How are you going to get it? You want to bring them in through whatever rabbit hole, as you want to call it, into content consumption around what you're producing. So that's really how we started. And when, when brands saw the outcomes, you know, getting 100,000 millions of views for not a lot of money. I mean, at that time, because it, there wasn't a lot to compete with, you're talking about spending less than $30,000 you know, the, the net CPM of it, like, okay, that, that made total sense. Let's, let's live stream as much as we can. We actually did a program where we live stream a, a partnership fashion show with Lexus and one of the designers doing New York Fashion Week. And look, those, those events, 300 people get to attend. You know how that works. But the live stream had 300,000 people watch it. So you ask the brand, you want to spend all this money for 300 or for 300,000? The math is very easy, and, and that's how we end up doing a lot of live stream around shows, is that unduplicated reach factor. I think now we're in a world where there could just, there's just kind of a digital, virtual, live equivalent to everything. What, what exists in the physical has a live, should have a live component for the people who can't be there in the flesh. And I think that's a very different notion in terms of where we are, which COVID put in play when our most coveted asset in America was turned off, and that was sports. Um, so when you start to think about how we love that and didn't have it, and then the first way it came back was, well, you can watch it live, you know, because uh, you can't be there in person, that really gave currency to, to open up the conversation for a lot of things. So love what was said on the influencer front. You know, obviously the other conversation is programmable content. Everyone can't get to the appointment time you set. So how else are you going to allow them to bring, bring them in to enjoy the experience? And that's where live comes into play. Let me, uh, I'm gonna... Because obviously with corporate guidelines, there are these rules and restrictions on how things need to be shot, brand standard. Look, I have to endorse them from some of our clients. Um, but I think what, when Google started talking about this notion of micro moments, you know, people looking at their phone 150 times, maybe that went to 400 during COVID, who knows? Um, you, 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 you can't be in the moment, you can't capitalize on all those micro moments if essentially everything requires so much runway to produce. And it's one thing to take shortcuts for the sake of, it's not another thing to play within a channel like live that actually almost requires you to do that. You know, to be a lot more turnkey, to have a more of a natural look, less filtered, less highly edited, um, more sort of first person point of view, I mean, that sort of gritty, very organic person on the street. So I think the good thing about live is it will tell brands it's okay to have different standards based upon the channel you're playing with because the user expectation is very different. They don't want to see an overly polished TV spot. They want it to look rough. And I think that was the hardest thing about, about YouTube building its credibility is that everything looks rough and, and amateur. And it's like, yeah, but they love it. And brands like, ah, we don't love it, <laughs> you know? And now live and TikTok, it's like, okay, we love it too, <laughs> but how do we make it look good but rough, you know? And that's the interesting dichotomy when brands saying, how do we make it good but look like we didn't spend a whole lot of money and make it look a little bit rough? So I think that is gonna be a huge transition piece coming out of 2021 into, the, into 2022 when brands have a, a much more adaptability in the sandbox because live has a particular lens or, or filter or, or unfiltered look that warrants uh, playing in that channel, that the other channels, uh, there's more of a sliding scale, but for in, in live environment, it almost like doesn't have a place. Well, that's a great point because brands don't have blocks of, of brand wearing like they used to, where I'm gonna get uh, the attention of the user for an hour straight. Now you have to sit together five seconds, 10 seconds, 12 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, back to five seconds, and hopefully it adds up to a formulated impression by the end of the day. And if they don't acknowledge that that is just gonna be an ever increasing accelerating challenge, they'll, they'll struggle to have consumers piece together their narrative. So there's so many inflection points where someone could take in a brand and understand and decide, okay, this is a brand for me, this is a product choice for me, but it comes in all these bits and pieces and they have to start thinking about the portability of their content. Uh, the idea that we can break it up into a lot of little, little pieces, but if someone looks at the sum of its parts, it means X. And that's, that's, you have to be very intentional about the fact that if you have a 90 second story, you have to break it up in 10 blocks and all those blocks, time frame are different, 
but you have to get them all out there in a day so they get the story together and then make a decision. Whereas historically, you just had the 90 seconds as a given. I think that is where the biggest challenge is going to be for the modern marketers. Like, how do we make sense of that? Uh, and and what is the, what's the impact with att- the attrition of those long blocks of time? And kind of what we were getting into in our panel was the time shifting around all things video. They're not turning off stuff. If they're time shifting, that means they're reducing something to add to something else. So they could contract linear TV or connect TV exposure to add TikTok or live exposure. So now you can't win in a lane. You have to dial it up in another lane, but you're still having to add all the pieces back together. That'll be, it, that'll, it'll be interesting to watch the evolution as to how people sort of manage that, that, that particular uh, challenge. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I like how you started earlier when you talk about it kind of hacks through the algorithm. Uh, because that tends to feed what your perceived tendencies are in live is more dynamic discovery. I talk to clients about discovery a lot. Like a live consumer, someone who likes to view it live, is trying to discover opportunistically something of interest. And the question is, are you there in those moments or the, the moment when they are essentially looking for it? And we just ran it. We never really promoted it. We trusted that there is there are people surfing for content. They're constantly looking for something new, and then there was a peop, there was an audience of people who just troll for what is happening in the moment, and that's really what we capitalized on. On now, it would be a mix of things because live is more mature in terms of the audience understanding of what they're looking at. So you can actually you know you can program it in. There's actually programming around it, but then it was very much about this the notion of look there not everyone is fixing you know a, a DVR to a certain time or going to be in front of the uh, television during a certain appointment time. There are people who are just literally, as they say, scrolling, 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 sifting, sifting, just trying to discover what's new. And that's how a lot of things are, are discovered across TikTok. In an, inter- in, in, in an interesting note, it's kind of the way the TikTok algorithm sort of works. It really looks opportunistically versus some of the other algorithms like a YouTube, which is, is more based on like be, uh, past behavior. TikTok is more predictive. Live has a mix of all those elements and some of it is like purely random. And they just need to understand in this era with so much content being created, there is a lot of random content discovery. The question is, do you have a brand suited for that? And look, I think there's certain categories that may be out of bounds, let's say insurance, things that have long lead time, maybe uh, car, car buying. But then there are things that are so impulsive like that random discovery sort of works. Uh, and I think that the other thing is there are times of day when that is more rampant, late night, when people are just killing time, um, trying to find something different, uh, you know, something 1, 2 a.m. where that really works. And then maybe it doesn't work during key you know, drive time to work. So, again, I, I think that is the thing that with everything being so algorithm intensive, user behavior locks them out of the opportunity of discovery just without even knowing where their live tends to circumvent that and play by its own rules so content can still be discovered without the consumer already having dictated, well, I won't see that. Uh, so that's really been our thing. Even when we did the New York Fashion Week show, we didn't really promote it. We just did it. But it was the height of New York Fashion Week. A lot of people were just Googling and looking for content, and they found the show we streamed, and they would never have gotten a look because those are super, you know, um, a VIP, invite only. I mean, you, you know how that works. So we looked at it as we're going to treat hundreds of thousands to something they would just never have been exposed to before. Uh, in, in particular, if you're living on the other side of the country or the other side of the globe. It's a, it's, I'm glad you brought up some of the examples because the thing in virtual is you can steal best in class work in other categories. Like let's take Fortnite. Let's take Travis Scott performing inside of Fortnite. And Fortnite's more of a social network than a gaming platform. We did a virtual conference and the first thing we talked about is, okay, we have a waiting room. Uh, let's get a DJ. Let's get a DJ to entertain him because we couldn't afford the DJ in real life to go to the event. <laughs> you know, or an international DJ charges 10 grand. So we're like, let's get a DJ in there. How do we entertain them? Because it worked in, it works on Twitch. You know, a lot of the artists who couldn't perform in concerts went over to Twitch to perform on streamers' platforms because it's another platform for a live tune-in audience.